Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you today, and for those of you online, we welcome you as well. We're excited uh, to, to celebrate God today, to encourage one another in our faith journey, and to celebrate the fact that uh, tomorrow is a, a national holiday. Tomorrow's July 4th, and we're excited to hang out together tomorrow starting at 6.30. Pastor Chris will talk a little bit more about that, but um, happy almost Independence Day. Um, we celebrate that as well, and we're thankful for that. But this morning, the freedom that we have, the independence in our spirit from sin and death comes from none other than Jesus Christ. And so we celebrate that long before we celebrate anything else. And so would you stand with us this morning? We're going to sing a song that we haven't sung probably in a really long time. It's called Forever Rain. And it says, I'm running to your arms, Jesus. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. So today, we're going to sing that God is good. That he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our attention and our time. Let's lift our voices today, all right? You are good, you are good. When there's nothing good in me, you are loved.
So good to be with you all. Um, yeah, exciting, exciting days. I'm really excited, although obviously a little bummed that we can't shoot fireworks. Um, but nonetheless, we can still be together. Am I? Is my? Oh, there it is. Okay, it wasn't sounding like it for me. So, okay. Um, yeah. So we can't. We it, nobody. You know, I don't know if you've caught it, but there's a stage one fire ban, all that. So, no fireworks, but we still will get together. Um, we still will get together tomorrow evening. Um, we'll have we'll have some burgers and dogs ready. Um, and if you guys can bring stuff with you um, for barbecue, whatever that is, but the church will pick up the the, the burgers and buns and whatnot and, and and that sort of thing. So come hang out with us. We got some we got some fun things, fun games that that we'll have out, um, bouncy house and you know uh, other things too. So anyways, so that's that's tomorrow. Uh, but I've got I've got the announcements today, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get into it. Um, next week um, is a is a big Sunday for us. Excuse me, um, it's a big Sunday for us. There's gonna be a, a church vote. You've been hearing about it over the last couple of weeks, um, and that is that is concerning Sheree and I as co-pastors. Um, the the vote is ultimately whether or not um, we would we would affirm or whatever. Uh, whatever uh, adverb you want to put in there um, uh, for Sheree to be, for Sheree and I to um, live and operate as co-pastors, which, by the way, we already kind of do. Um, we have for the last, well, I'd say 17 years, but even before that, even when we were just dating and she was helping me with my youth group, um, we still kind of operated that way. And it's just been the way it is. I've heard, you know, I've heard, you guys, I've heard, uh, you know, people who are married say, you know, we're, you know, this is my partner in crime or whatever. And well, that's kind of the deal. And so anyway, so so next Sunday, we'll be giving language to that. Uh, this Sunday here, just a little bit, um, we'll we'll have we'll have a little interview to help open up some questions or whatever um, that that we'll, we're not opening up the floor to questions yet. But but we will be answering some questions. The board will be talking to us just to kind of uh, help people understand what's going on and what we're trying to do there. So um, so that is that. Um, which, by the way, you guys, um, I don't know if it's a thing, but but if anybody's wondering, is is this Cherie's idea? Is this pastor's idea? Is this whose idea? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is not, I, I'm in this. I have been for 17 years. And and I love it, so so that's my two cents for now. Okay, okay, all right. So, but directly after service next week, um, Shree and I and the kids we're going to be taking off um, directly after service next week. Um, there is a pastors and leaders conference that that uh, kind of rotates through our denominational schools. Um, 
this year, both NNU and I think Trebekah are hosting it, but it's every four years on a rotation. Um, and this year just happens to be NNU's uh, uh, privilege to host that. So we'll be taking off for that. Um, and then we're going to stay for a little bit because it's at NNU. Uh, and my mom lives just up the road from there. So, so we'll be spending some time with her um, uh, just after that. So we'll miss a couple of Sundays there. Um, but that doesn't mean you guys, oh, the pastor's gone. We don't have to come. No, still come. You still, still good. Still, still come because we've got some good coverage um, for you all. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, guys, and continue. So as we, as we continue on this, man, we're we're really working pretty hard at developing stuff as we coming out of COVID. That's really the hope that we're kind of coming out of, right? Even though we still hear of people getting sick and whatever, we're still kind of leaning into that, to, to life um, beyond pandemic. And so so participation, you guys, it's a beautiful thing in the life of the body. Uh, that's participation physically, that's participation uh, economically, that's, that's participation. Because guess what? Um, part of your economic participation is I can buy burgers and buns for tomorrow evening, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't which means you would end up buying it and, or somebody or whatever, right? So you understand the concept of a community participating with one another in the life of the church. So that would be awesome. And so with that, economically, um, we do need to continue. You guys, um, every, every Sunday, there's at least a few dollars or checks in the offering box right back here. And you guys know we, we don't pass the plates. And I just want you to know, if you ask me why, um, it happened before I got here, um, why we don't pass the plates and there's an offering box. But apparently it was a good move when they did it, um, however long ago. So that is there for you to, and every Sunday, uh, we need people to help count, um, to take it in the back. So um, if you are able today, that would be awesome. We are going to renew because Ryan Guitro had been the one kind of running that and keeping people on it. Um, and obviously, he's been uh, a little distracted, if you will. Um, and so, so we're kind of helping to get that going again. We need to make sure that we get those, those monies counted every Sunday after church. So if you can today and even the next couple weeks, um, talk to Tanya or myself, Tanya Baird. She'll be up here in just a little bit. Um, um, and make sure we, we keep our, our counts going and, and getting them de deposited as soon as we can. A um, couple other things. Okay, um, uh, guys, youth group is still happening. Um, the, the weekly orders are still happening. You know, weekly happenings are still uh, on the calendar. So youth group, 630 right here. Unless you guys, you hear otherwise, like last week, the text went out that we were at our house and we barbecued. We'll be doing more of that kind of stuff. Um, something that Ken started years ago, summertime events out. We'll go for a hike or we'll go do something like that. And we'll, we'll keep some of that stuff kind of going. Um, but also on that, for you guys that, under, that, that know this, I want you, uh, this needs to be in your ear. Next summer, a big summer, there's general, super, general, general assembly, but there's also what's called uh, NYC, Nazarene Youth Conference. It's every four years. It's a big big, big event. Um, I was not able to attend as a teen, but I was able to attend as a youth pastor in my life. We went to Houston, and, um, and there were, there were 8,000 kids that gather from around North America, and, and even some that can make it from across the globe uh, to this conference. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big event, and it's super fun, super impactful um, there's all kinds of stuff going on there. There's worship events, there's breakout sessions, there's teaching, there's all kinds of things that bring kids along, developing them in their faith. Um, there's, also, there's also projects. We painted a house, my little group. We went down downtown Houston and we painted a house, um, which by the way, Michael, painting a house in 80 degree humidity in Houston when it's 90 degrees outside, it was a barn red house, and we were trying to paint it white. Yeah, it was a challenge. <laughs> I, I hope they paid for somebody to come along behind us and fix it. 
we did our best. We did our best. We worked hard. So, anyways, that is coming, and we want to we want to make sure that that's available for all all the teams. Um, okay, am I getting too long winded here? Let me make sure I've, I'm covering all my stuff. What's that? I covered July fourth, didn't I? Yep, I did. Yep. Um, uh, oh, can, continue. Oh, the volunteerism. I talked about that. Um, Co-pastoring. Oh, next week, by the way, um, next week during that Sunday, that will be, um, that is a Sunday that's already on, on schedule for our DS to be here. So the district superintendent will be here. If you're interested to meet him, and if you, if you don't know the, the, the process, um, that's, he, he's our district leadership. Um, he is a superintendent for Colorado District. Um, and he is, he's new to us. He hasn't been on the job yet a year, um, uh, but closing in on a year, uh, 11 months, 10 months, something like that. And, man, his name's Virgil Askren. Uh, he comes to us from Arkansas District over the last couple of years. He was in Arkansas as district superintendent. Um, but before that, he spent 20-some years, I believe it was that long, in Bend, Oregon as the pastor there. Um, and so he is, he is now our district. And he's, you guys, he's been great. Um, you will indeed enjoy him. So, um, so show up for that. Um, make sure I'm covering it all, I think. Oh, um, it, just, a, just a, a side note here concerning, if, if, you're, if you're curious, um, the co-pastor thing, there is, there is examples of that. Um, there's some friends of ours, Dustin and Olivia Metcalf. Um, they, they had co-pastored a church, actually a church where Sheree and I met in Mountain Home, Idaho. They had co-pastored that church, and then when they went, they, they were chaplains at NNU, and they kind of co-chaplained at NNU. Um, they are now district superintendents in New York. Well, they don't co-district superintendents, but she is district superintendent. Um, uh, but also, our general superintendent, um, Carla Sundberg, her and her husband have, have co-led on certain arenas as well. So it's not new. It's not necessarily, um, uh, there's not a lot of people, although a growing amount of, of, of spouses that are co-pastors coming to understand, hey, I'm ordained, you're ordained, we should live into that ordination together. Um, and so that's what that is. So anyways, okay, okay, that said, I think I've got that, and I am getting along with it. So I've got today, um, I, we've got a few people to, to bring in to membership. Um, and this is always super exciting for us um, to, to bring people in. W one of them is indeed a transfer member, um, David Jones. I hope you've met David Jones um, I'll, I'll come to you, just I'll come down in a minute, David. Just hang tight, and I'll come down since so you don't have to stand longer than necessary. Okay, so so D David has been he's been a Nazarene church down in in Canyon City uh, for for several years down there. Um, recently, um, some it, life events, I guess you could say, has brought him up here. He's at the Bonaventure right now. Um, um, and the, the, the church, actually, it's an interesting thing. I'm still actually working with the DS on, on the language for it. But, but that church had closed, actually, um, um, which is kind of hard to reach out to the pastor and say, hey, can you transfer this membership? Because <laughs> uh, there's not one. Um, so we're still kind of working on the language for that. But nonetheless, David, he's been a part of the Nazarene Church for a long time. And um, since you were, boy, what would you say? Since you were like 16 or something, part of the Nazarene Church? It's been a long time. Yeah, um, so so we're gonna we're gonna uh, accept his transfer, uh, and then also Casey Van Van Gell. Um, she is not necessarily new to us. She's new to the Nazarene Church in membership, um, but she's been a part of our church for a couple of years now. Um, it, you'll know that that some of the paintings on the wall are hers, and every now and again she is one. Between her and Jennifer Kappas are the ones. Um, doing the painting during service and stuff. So um, the language I want to give to this, it's very important, is, is what membership 
ultimately is and is not. One, you guys, it's not indoctrination. That's not what membership is. We teach and we hold to our Nazarene truths and beliefs, um, both as Wesleyans and Nazarenes. Um, but the most important, at least for your pastor, the most important of them is when we bring someone into membership, we are declaring our maybe partnership, if you will, with them in this life of faith. That we are, we are declaring with them, hey, you've been a part of us. Why don't, we, why don't we make this or put language to it, if you will, that, that you're part of us. And we're going to commit to you. If you're going to commit to us, we're going we're gonna to make this mutual commitment. And many of you have done that, and many of you understand that. Say, yeah, you know what? They have been a part of us, and I'm going to commit to them. I'm going to commit to praying for them. I'm going to commit to praying for their kids if they have some, um, to their life. I'm going to commit to helping when they're in crisis or when they're in, in, in pain or whatever, or, or, or even when there's joys to be had. We're going to celebrate together. And so ultimately, at least for your pastor, membership is about declaring those things over one another, is that we are indeed in this life together. We do, like I said, we do still hold to our Nazarene deal. We're not throwing that out. We are Nazarene, and we do have particular doctrines and understandings, um, and we hold to those. But again, we are happy to partner with. So um, David down here, he's uh, a, a little bit uh, impaired mobily, so I'm going to come down here um, with him, and then I'll come over with 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 Casey and and bring her and bring her up here. Um, but let me let me catch this first. If you have not met David, you guys, this is David Jones. Um, he has been coming for several months now. Um, well, I guess several months, two three months, huh? About two months. Yeah, first of March. Um, and he's been a part of us, and he again, he's been a part of the Nazarene Church for. Um, for a long time, and so he is. He is coming on, and we will. Um, we will walk him over here. Oops. Church, the the blessings, the privileges, and blessings that we have in community together in the Church of Jesus Christ are sacred. And indeed precious. There is in it such hallowed fellowship, care, and counsel as cannot otherwise be known apart from the family of God. And there, there is the godly care of pastors with the teaching of the word and the inspiration of corporate worship. And there is cooperation and service, accomplishing that which cannot otherwise be done. So today we affirm again the doctrines and practices of the church. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that human beings are born in sin, which we're going to talk about today. That they need the work of forgiveness through Christ and the new birth of the Holy Spirit. That subsequent to this, there is the deeper work of heart cleansing or what we call entire sanctification through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that to each of these works of grace, the Holy Spirit gives witness. We believe that our Lord will return, that the dead will be raised, and that all shall come to final judgment with its rewards and punishment. So today we affirm again the agreed statement of belief for the Church of the Nazarene, that there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the Old Testament and New Testament scriptures given by plenary inspiration contain all truths necessary, necessary to faith and Christian living, that human beings are born with a fallen nature and are therefore inclined to evil, and that continually. That finally, the impenitent are hopelessly eternally lost. That the atonement through Jesus Christ is for the whole human race, and that whoever repents and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is justified and regenerated and saved from the dominion of sin. That believers are to be sanctified holy, subsequent to regeneration through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit bears witness to new birth and also to the entire sanctification of believers, and that our Lord will return, the dead will be raised, and 
final judgment will take place. Do you heartily believe these truths? If so, David, would you answer, I do? Amen. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you believe that he saves you now? If so, answer. I do. Amen. Amen. So de desiring to unite with the church of the Nazarene, do you commit to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? and your neighbor as yourself, as expressions by the covenant of Christian character and conduct? Do you commit to the mission of God as expressed in the doctrine, fellowship, and work of the Church of the Nazarene? Will you support the teachings of the Church of the Nazarene and strive with God's help to grow in your understanding and practice of the same in a way that enhances the witness of the Church? And will you endeavor in every way to glorify God by a humble walk, godly conversation, and holy service, by, devoted, by devotedly giving of your resources, by, and by faithfully participating in the means of grace, will you follow Jesus Christ all the days of your lives, absent from all evil, and seek earnestly to perfect holiness of heart and life in fear of the Lord? If so, answer, I will. I will. And church, for you, similar question. Will you participate with David? Will you pray for David? Will you spend time knowing David? Will you commit to David in this life? If so, church, answer, we will. We will. Amen. David, it is good to have you. It is good to give language to what we believe is indeed Christian faith. That is a community of people walking this life together. So, David, I hope that this church will indeed get to know you and you will get to know them and they will walk with you and care for you in these days. Amen. Amen. And, and Casey, if you would come up here. Um, uh, so I'm doing this a little, a little different, like separate, just because for David to sit was better um, or to, to stay down there was better. Um, Casey is is able here, but I, I'm not going to read through everything that I just read through, but I will read through the commitments here um, with with Casey. Um, and, you know, she has she has two kids. Um, she has um, um, Auburn and Nate who are with their dad right now in in Ohio, I believe. Uh, and they'll be back here soon. Um, and. And you guys, I think we're going to be doing this with their kids here pretty quick, too. We're going to be talking to them within a second. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, super cool. We are excited, uh, to give, again, to give language to um, the life of the church and what it means to participate in the church. Yeah. So, Casey, it, do you believe these truths that we had just read with David? Do you believe these truths to be so? And if so, would you answer, I do? Amen. Yep. And do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you believe that he saves you now? I do. Amen. 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 So desiring to unite the church, so desiring to unite with the church of the Nazarene, do you commit to love the Lord your God with all your heart? soul, mind, and strength, do your neighbor as yourself, as expressed by the covenant of Christian character and conduct? Do you commit to the mission of God as expressed in the doctrine, fellowship, and work of the Church of the Nazarene? Will you support the teachings of the Church of the Nazarene and strive with God's help to grow in your understanding and practice of the same in a way that enhances the witness of the Church? Will you endeavor in every way to glorify God by a humble walk, godly conversation, holy service, by devotedly giving of your resources and by faithfully participating in the means of grace, will you follow Jesus Christ all the days of your lives, abstain from all evil, and seek earnestly to perfect holiness of heart and life in the fear of the Lord? If so, answer, I will. Amen. Amen. And again, church, will you hold to the same? Will you commit to praying with and for Casey and her two kids, will you commit to walk with her in difficulty and in joy? 
Will you participate with her and her faith in this life? If so, would you please answer, we will. Amen. 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 Casey, thanks for being a part. We love you, and we love your kids, and we're glad you're with us. Amen. All right. Well, you have just been introduced, I hope not for the first time, uh, to a couple of uh, new members. So when we come to fellowship, um, don't be scarce. Be friendly. <laughs> Introduce yourself if you haven't. If you get a chance, um, and get to know our new members. Um, and I think, where are we at now? Byron. Byron's coming. Good morning, church. So, real quick, uh, what we're going to do right now is, everyone is familiar when Pastor Sharif, Pastor Chris... Uh, interview new attendees that start our church. Well, as a church board, what we thought we would do is flip the script and actually interview Pastor Sheree, Pastor Chris on what's coming with this vote next week. However, before that, I didn't hear it. I want to announce, too, that the church has found some good news for members that uh, are not able to attend next week but want to participate in the, the vote there will be an option to do that for a call-in. And what I'm going to say right now is wait for correspondence to come through email this week on instructions on how that's going to work, all right? So for members who will not be able to attend, we'll have the opportunity to call in in a window to uh, participate in the vote and or address the floor with a question if there's a question during that vote time. So I want to make sure that's very clear. The second thing as the board that we've seen, there's really what we've gathered. There's been a little bit of confusion saying, why are we doing this? I thought this was already the case. So I want we want to be very clear that the reason why we're having a vote, it's, it's it, uh, if I could do it this way, when you talk about your church, yes, I attend Connection Church of the Nazarene. Uh, pastor Chris is our pastor. You wouldn't say that anymore. If she is affirmed as a co-pastor, you would say, yes, I attend Connection Church of the Nazarene. Our co-pastors, Pastor Chris and Pastor Sheree, they would be co-leadership. Does everybody understand? All right. So I'd like to invite the church board members to come forward, Pastor Chris, Pastor Sheree. And uh, we have a few uh, questions that we would like to ask them in front of the church. And we'll start with Tammy. All right, good morning. My question for the two of you is, what does co-pastoring mean to you personally? You is this on? Is you this on? You got it. Yeah. It's not on? Yep, you got it now. <laughs> it's on. So, uh, just in case you haven't seen, um, we wanted to make sure that I'm, I'm a really visual learner. I'll talk about that later in my sermon this morning. But I have to see what it means to have explanations. And so we do have a number that are still out there of um, Chris and my philosophy of ministry as co-pastors. And one of the favorite things I have is a Venn diagram. A Venn diagram is two circles. There's one side. That's Chris, and there's one side that's me, and then there's a center that overlaps. And that centerpiece is what we do together, our shared ministry, our teamwork. And then what the edges of that Venn diagram are, where Chris has his own couple things and I have my own couple things, are our unique giftings, right? Because I'm not him, and he's not me. And we bring, it's a surprise, um, <laughs> we bring different giftings and different um, skills and different weaknesses to ministry. So it is shared ministry, unique gifting, and teamwork. And we already act that way. We already do that. Um, and it would just be a, a recognition mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. You want to ask those two? I well, don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know that I would add much to that. Um, it really is giving language to the way we live and operate, the way we always have lived and operated. So 
You, you'll see, though, on that Venn diagram, clearly that Sheree is on the worship side of that, and I am not. Um, uh, that's just an example of what she's talking about. There are things that she does and has ability to, uh, and things that I do not, and vice versa. Um, and so that is just the way we, it, yeah, it's the way we operate. And, and by the way, if you're, if you're wondering or if you've thought even further about it, remember, uh, Shri has finished her coursework in the Church of the Nazarene. And two years ago, she was ordained as an elder in the Church of the Nazarene. So she, she does hold credentials in the Church of the Nazarene. Um, and so with that uh, comes titling, if you will. Um, and so that's part of, the, part of the, the answer, I guess. Yeah. yeah. What I love about what Chris and I have always done together from when we were dating early on and all the way till now is we navigate what it looks like in Scripture to um, be accountable to one another and to pour into ministry in a way that asks and honors each other to say, what do you bring to the table? Here's my perspective. How can we work together? Now, hear me. Um, we had the board ask us a great question. How are you going to handle conflict? I said, hey, the same way we handle conflict now. Um, we talk it out. We bring it to other groups of people. By the way, you guys, we believe in counseling. We believe in marriage counseling. We did pre-marriage counseling. Uh, we believe that we're supposed to have people around us. The board and the staff participates in uh, times where Chris and I see things in a different perspective. So if you wonder, like, how is this going to work? Where does the buck stop? The buck stops with us yeah. together. There's no hierarchy here because we believe and understand that God calls us all to be community. Chris and I would co-pastor, which would mean that we would actually both be legally responsible for the decisions of the church, not just Chris. It would actually be me as well. Um, and we'd be able to bring both our voices in deep and great ways to the greater church body. So our district would, re would recognize us both as um, able to pour in to any decisions that need to be made. The global Church of the Nazarene would recognize me along with Chris as our voices being able to pour into decisions. So it changes some of the ways that look. It doesn't change, really, the way we currently work here. Right. It's, a, it's almost like right. a, a title change and a recognition right. change. Right. Yeah, and so just to add, before the board asks another question, just to add, understand the Church of the Nazarene is led by what's called the Board of General Superintendents. There is not a one lead. There's a six, a board of six that, that lead our denomination. And so, so the idea of co-leadership is certainly not a new thing. Okay, well, I guess I really didn't need to come up here. Uh, the next question is, how do you see your ministry changing as you transition into co-pastors? Yeah, and in the same kind of concept there, it, it is a, you know, when, when you have somebody ask, like uh, I think Byron just mentioned, when you have somebody ask, um, who's the pastor at your church? The answer changes, right? Now it would be, if, if you affirm the vote, it would be pastors Chris and Cherie, um, the co-pastor team. So that would change, and that is a different conversation that happens at district level, so a lot of different things would change in how we um, acknowledge responsibility, how we make decisions, how we bring those decisions back to the board and back to you would change, and it would be both of our jobs. Um, but I think we answered some of those in the early. I'm glad you're here, though. I wanted you to come up. I think I appreciate it. Yeah. Did you have any extra? So the next question is, how do you see co-pastorship position strengthening the current structure of our church? I'll let you start because I, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah. How, how, say it again. How does it change? How does it strengthen? To strengthen uh, the current structure. Um, well, it, it, it strengthens in this, that now um, Shree would have uh, – I don't like the language, but maybe I don't have better language for it. But Shri would have a particular authority that she hasn't had before, um, um, and that that is, and that, and that that is, um, well, it's, it's given, I guess. It's imparted. It's it's. Um, I don't know that I have real good language other than that. That that it is strengthened because now 
she has um, a, a, a given title that carries with it uh, authority for, for particular things. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I think so when I think of this word, it actually is a really beautiful invitation to us as a church body to look around and recognize that um, there is diversity in our congregation. Mm -hmm. There are different genders in our congregation. And I bring a different perspective than Chris brings when I preach. Um, I preach very differently. I bring a different way of ministering and a different way of loving and a different way of engaging relationship than Chris brings. Um, Chris also is incredibly kind in the way that he challenges me. So when um, I fall short in my attitudes or when I fall short in the way that I lead, my husband is uh, an incredible co-leader. He challenges me to stand up and to readdress those things. So strength comes in hand with other weaknesses, but the weaknesses I have, Chris doesn't have, and the weaknesses he has, I don't have. And so co-pastoring is a linking of arms, which I hope that in this church, in our conversations with you, you understand that you're invited to do the same kind of thing. Link mm -hmm. arms with That's each right. other on every Sunday, yep. thinking and praying for each other during the week as you yep. link arms because we're a community of people that says, I'll, I'll walk with you, I'll help take care of you, I'll right. challenge you when I, when I see something, right. and I'll, I'll encourage you. Right. That's um, what we just did in membership, by yeah, the way. That's and for those did. of you that claim membership, like David and Casey, that's, yeah. that's what we've just done. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Yeah. Okay, so that ends our questions. I think as a church board, we just want to wrap it up that basically what we're doing is we're doing it officially by the Church of the Nazarene's uh, uh, manual and rules to our organization. We're doing it the right way. The last few weeks we've been letting you know so that nobody should not know. Uh, and then I think to uh, wrap it up, we just want to say that so they've been co-ministering together as a couple since they've met. They've been here for five years. And now as a church, we've recognized that. Mm -hmm. And we recognize the efforts that Pastor Cherie has put forth in to be a pastor. And I think that this is finally saying as a church that all of us together are saying, yes, we recognize this and we see this and we want this. So that's what this vote is about next week. It'll be at 10 o'clock next week, uh, 10 a.m. And then, like I said, watch for the email for those members that won't be here and want to participate. All right. So thank you for answering the questions. And uh, there will be time to answer, ask questions uh, next Sunday morning for the general church at the, at the vote. Yeah, so at that, you guys, um, I would invite you to um, stand and say hello to one another. Spend a few moments in fellowship with one another. Uh, grab a bagel if you need a bagel. But hey, guys.
singing together this morning. Let's stand and worship the Lord together. His love is great. He is the Lord Almighty. To your name, we 
like the wildest ocean Oh, nothing else compares Oh, nothing else compares Amen? Amen. Well, we're here to worship today. Just in case you were wondering and you look around, you'll see kids and teens leading us today. And we are here today to be in family worship. And we love that because they're not the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. And so we lift our voices today and we're here to worship God and we're being led by young ones. Let's praise. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. the reason that we worship. And Father God, today as we lean into a time of prayer where we lift needs and concerns to you, as we lift joys and hopes to you, I ask, Father, that we would lean into your presence. Lord, if there's anything that's in the way in our mind, anything that we have done to step away from you. Jesus, I ask that you would forgive us and help us to lean into your presence. We want to hear you today, and we want to be transformed by you, and we can't do that on our own. So, Jesus, would you be our Lord? In Jesus' name, Pastor Chris is coming as we continue in worship and prayer this morning, lifting our needs to him.
scripture today. Galatians chapter 6. Starting verse 7. Make no mistake, God is not mocked. A person will harvest what they plant. Those who plant only for their own benefit will harvest devastation from their selfishness. But those who plant for the benefit of the Spirit will harvest eternal life from the Spirit. Let's not get tired of doing good, because in time, we'll have a harvest if we don't give up. So then, let's work for the good of all whenever we have opportunity, and especially for those in the household of faith. Look at the large letters I am making with my own handwriting. Whoever wants to look good by human standards will try to get you to be circumcised, but only so they won't be harassed for the cross of Christ. Those who are circumcised don't observe the law themselves, but they want you to be circumcised so that they can boast about your physical body. But as for me, God forbid that I should boast about anything except for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through him, and I have been crucified to the world. Being circumcised or not being circumcised doesn't mean anything. What matters is new creation. Amen? May peace and mercy be on whoever follows this rule on God's Israel. From now on, no one should bother me because I bear the marks of Jesus on my body. Brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's go to prayer this morning. God, we thank you for your message. We thank you for your story. We thank you that you have indeed invited us into this story and indeed made a way that we might be able to participate with you in the newness of life. So God, this morning we celebrate the newness of life in the membership that we have declared and committed one to another, that we will live into your story of mutual submission and commitment. And God, we thank you for all that you are doing in our midst. We stand hopeful and grateful for all that you do. God, we pray for those who are sick, for those who are facing challenges. God, we pray your presence. Mm -hmm. We pray healing. We yes, pray Lord. redemption and wholeness. Yes, Lord. We pray, God, for your presence to be among us. Mm. We know it is. So, God, I pray that we would see it, uh, that we would be sensitive to it, that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear your voice, your activity and your goodness in and among us. Yes, Lord. Mm. Yeah, Jesus, we want to lift up uh, a couple of our needs in this church family. And so, Lord, we pray for Mary Lou and the surgery that's coming this week. We ask, Lord, that you would guide doctor's hand, that your spirit would be in that operating room, and that Mary Lou would experience an incredible sense of peace and calm as she um, goes under. Lord, I ask that everything would go as planned, that it would be a boring surgery mm. because everything just is great. And, Lord, I ask um, that you would comfort her family as they wait to hear the word. Lord, thanks that Wilma Dodd is here today. Lord, we prayed for her as uh, she was sick and fighting sepsis in the hospital. Lord, thanks that she's here today. Yeah. Thanks that she's uh, worshiping with us. And, Lord, there are needs that um, you know about that we can't necessarily bring um, and speak about right now in our church family. So we lay those before you. We ask that you would move ahead of the issues, ahead of the problems. We ask that there would be redemption and restoration. We ask there'd be hope in the middle of it. Jesus, you are good and you're kind and we love you and we're, th we're so thankful that your spirit is with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.
Well, uh, it's super fun uh, to preach. And by the way, again, this is Family Sunday. So if, if uh, the kids and the teens, can you just holler, hey? Wow. Let's try that again. Kids and teens, just holler, hey. Okay, let's a little, a little more excitement. That was like a little bit, I don't know, nervous. One more time, just say, hey. Okay, so now you know where they are, and I want you to turn to them, adults, if you're in the room, I want you to look at them in the eye and say, I'm really glad you're here. You know what? It's a big deal to be together as a church. It might be noisier, and you know what's, what's great about a noisy church? It's an alive church. Do you know that? If it's quiet, it's not an alive church. So we've been uh, in this this series called Understanding Our Faith. And Pastors Chris and Pastor Kristen and I wanted you to grow deeper and understand all the things that we believe. Well, why would we want to do that? We are called to be a people of God so transformed by restored relationship with God that we want to make a space in our daily lives for those outside kingdom faith to find honest and real friendship with us, as well as those inside, right here, kingdom of faith, to encourage and spur one another on in the ways of Jesus. And we want to offer all a place to belong and genuinely learn to love each other. That's why we want to understand our faith. We did the seat at the table. We keep talking about it. We're going backwards to remind you guys where we come from. We did the seat at the table series where we had five tables in here set up lovingly by hostesses, and those tables were to represent, hey, we're supposed to be inviting everyone we know to a place where they're welcome and seen and invited to be loved, not only by us, but by God the Father. Because if they're loved by us, maybe they'll hear the voice of the king and come to a relationship with him. And that's what we did with the seat of the table. Then right after the seat of the table, we went into the Easter season, which is a huge celebration in the church, because we recognized the death of Jesus Christ on the cross to atone for our sin and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to silence sin and death, right? Like, those are the big, big deals for us. So Easter, we did that. And then right after that, we did the Surprise the World series. Surprise the World taught us to what? Bless each other and those outside faith to eat together with each other in our church and those outside the faith to listen to one another inside the church and outside the faith to learn from one another inside the church and outside of faith and to be sent to make disciples of all people because we're disciples of Jesus Christ now I know you guys are doing all of those things Oh, I, I know you guys are doing all of those things. Amen. I hope you're doing all of those things. That was not a shame moment. We believe that you're called to that. Just because my title is pastor, pastor and potentially co-pastor doesn't mean that's not your job too. Did you know that? That we're all a part of the priesthood of believers. We're all called to minister. We're all called to talk to people and love people and invite them. So we're excited to be doing these things with you. And we're in this series called Understanding Our Faith, which is walking us through the 16 articles of faith in the Church of the Nazarene. Now, Pastor Chris has already walked us through the first four. The triune God, which is what we believe God is and understand through Scripture, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is one, and three unique parts, and one, and three separate, and still one. Right? Super clear. And then... <laughs> And then Pastor Chris last week talked us through scripture and walked us through understanding what God's word is, how we're supposed to interact with it, how it affects our lives, how it transforms us, and um, that it's inerrant in all things pertaining to salvation. That's what we understand in the Church of the Nazarene. So today I have uh, the privilege of preaching on the next article of faith. And before we get to that, uh, we have been preparing for this day for a long time. You might think that I'm talking about something along with the church, but I'm not. 
um, the day, it, it's the, the preparation of the day where my husband and I move out of the driver's seat and into the passenger seat, and a child that just barely is out of diapers, just started walking, is in the driver's seat. <laughs> yeah, that's terrifying. Just kidding. She's doing a great job. My daughter just got her driver's permit. She took the test. She passed it. And I said, yay. Oh, man. So what, what is super exciting about that is uh, we have been actually preparing for this for a really long time. Um, if, you're, if you're like Chris and I, parenting doesn't have a schedule. You just parent. You teach and you train. And so for the last number of years, as we know that our kids are getting older, when we're driving, we have conversation and dialogue. Hey, so in a roundabout, this is what happens. Hey, your blinker tells other people what to do when you're turning. Hey, by the way, when you're um, encountering somebody who looks like they're a crazy driver, like a road rage driver, here's what you probably should do. Here's how to stay safe. Here's what you do if a policeman ever pulls you over, which probably should never happen because it increases your insurance, so don't ever do that. And we talk about all of those things with them. You drive differently when somebody's watching you, don't you? You drive differently when somebody is watching you. By the way, I have learned a few things from my daughter as she took these classes. Did you know, did you know that driving and you're holding the steering wheel is no longer 10 and 2? Who knew that? I did not know that. It's no longer 10 and 2. It's 9 and 3. I didn't know that. She was asking me before we were taking the test. She was like, Mom, what was it? Like, where do you hold your hands? I'm like, 10 and 2. She's like, no, that's not right. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It's moved to 9 and 3 because just in case you're driving, you have an accident, your hands aren't in the way, and they, blow, like, blow into your face and you break bones and stuff, 9 and 3 is actually safe. They've changed that. Did you, also, did you also know that when you're turning in your steering wheel, you're not supposed to cross over when you're turning? You're supposed to, like, shimmy. That's a thing. I didn't know that. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> so I've been driving really early on my way to Starbucks. I work there, by the way. If you didn't know that, I have another job outside of this job because Chris and I both believe that if we just stay in the walls of the church and minister just here, we're missing a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of relationships. So I get up 3.45, three to four mornings a week, and I drive to work. At 4 a.m. on Friday this last week, I was driving to work, and I'm coming over Founders, going north on Founders, and suddenly a car, which is, I don't see very many cars at that time in the morning, came my way and flashed me with his lights. And so I immediately thought, there's a deer in the road, that's what we do, like, there's deer early on in the morning because nobody's really driving that early. And as I crested the hill in a 50-mile-an-hour zone, going around 57, maybe 60, um, I see the backside of a cop, a police officer in the median. Take my foot slowly off the accelerator. Slight waves. Keep going. We drive differently when we're being watched, don't we? You know, my, thir my first thought when I saw that cop, luckily I slowed down, nothing happened. It was great, thank the Lord. Um, we'll talk about that later. Um, you know, my first thought was, I wish that he would be here when that guy that drives by me at like 85 miles at 4 a.m. in the morning drives past me. That guy needs a ticket as I'm slowing down in my car to an appropriate, just slightly above the speed limit speed. Isn't that funny? Well, what about you? Do you drive differently when somebody's watching you? Perhaps you have a new baby in the car. Or a kid. Or a teenager that just got her permit. Or a grandparent that definitely drives different than you. Maybe you drive differently when somebody else is in the car with you. What about when you see the friendly neighborhood police? I don't know about you, but my attention spikes. I'm uber aware of the distance between me and the other car in front of me. I make sure I use my blinkers. Sometimes I use my hands. I'm just kidding. I don't. But sometimes I use my bl you know, blinkers and make sure I'm doing that. But then you think about, oh, that right back brake light that I haven't fixed in three months. We drive differently when we're being watched. We have a friend here in our church that is a police officer. Um, we honor him, by the way. He's a great friend of ours. 
And he and Chris were just talking about the fact that he's so trained to see the things that people do wrong that when he gets home, it's really hard for him to not see the things wrong that's happening with his kids, right? And he told Chris, I got permission to share the story, by the way. He told Chris, Chris, I'm working that I am able to switch that mentality so I see the good things that my kids and my wife are doing, not the bad that I've been trained to do. Well, God has something to say to us today about sin. (laughs) Article of faith number five is about sin. But before you stop listening, before you look at your Facebook and Instagram and checking those texts and wondering how that sports team is doing, I want you to know that today is not about shame. I am not here to shame you. I do want you to understand what we believe and understand in the Church of the Nazarene, in the fifth article of faith about personal and original sin. We'll talk about that. Sin is something that separates us from God, and God is watching you, and he is paying attention. But it's not to catch you in the act of sin. It is to invite you to a place of transformation where you change your direction. You change the way you are. God invites you to that. So don't think of God, like I just talked about, with always seeing something wrong. God does see that. But he's inviting you to a new way of living, a new way of being. We want you to learn this article of faith in the Church of the Nazarene because it's going to learn how to help you. It's going to teach you to deepen your faith and maturity, to understand what's happening when we talk about sin and what God does to change you. So there's a quick video I have up here. It's about three minutes long. It's going to talk to you, give you an overview of all the things Chris has talked about, and give you a little teaser about this morning. So let's watch that video. There is a complete manual that outlines the beliefs and organization of the Church of the Nazarene. The videos in this series focus on the Articles of Faith section of this manual in a simplified form. For exact wording, as well as biblical references for these beliefs, please reference the manual. There are 16 articles of faith that we hold to in the Church of the Nazarene. The purpose of the articles of faith is to help us remember our God-given heritage, as well as to make our beliefs clear so that we can easily cooperate with other churches of Jesus Christ in ministry. The first article states a belief in the triune God, also known as the Trinity. To some outside the Christian faith, This may sound as if Christians believe in three gods, but that's not the case. We believe in one eternal and all-powerful holy God, the creator of the universe, who reveals himself to humankind as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The second article of faith speaks more specifically about Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. We believe that Jesus was always and forever one with the Father. He was present in the beginning, At just the right time in history, he became human by the Holy Spirit, was born an infant to the Virgin Mary, and therefore was both fully God and fully man while he lived on this earth. He died on the cross for our sins and rose physically from the dead. He ascended into heaven and constantly serves as the bridge between humankind and the Father. The third article of faith speaks about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. We believe that the Holy Spirit is always present and continually active in the Church of Christ. He convinces humans of their sin, restores those who repent and believe, sanctifies believers, and guides people to the truth of Jesus. The fourth article of faith describes what Nazarenes believe about the holy text of the Christian faith, known as the Bible or the Scriptures. The Bible is made up of 66 books split into the Old and New Testaments. We believe it was written by humans through inspiration from God and is without error in explaining the will of God concerning all we need to know about salvation. Therefore, Nazarenes will not have an article of faith that is not based fully in the scriptures. The fifth article of faith deals with the topic of original sin and personal sin. Original sin is a sin that was brought on by Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. The result of this sin was death for all. We are all born, therefore, into the consequences of original sin, 
which means we are not born with a pure spiritual life, and we are drawn to evil things continually. Our tendency towards evil even continues after salvation until our hearts are made fully clean and holy by the Holy Spirit, a work and process known as sanctification. Personal sins are different because they are the intentional choices made by morally responsible people that go directly against the known will of God. Personal sins can be outward actions or internal attitudes. Sin, therefore, should not be confused with mistakes or accidental failures that cannot be avoided, simply because we are human beings living after the sin of Adam and Eve. All right, so that's an overview of what we're, we have learned from Pastor Chris uh, over the last two sermons and then what you're learning today about sin. We're going to take that all kind of apart so that we understand together what's happening here in the conversation around sin. So we're going to turn to Genesis 3. If you have your Bibles, open them with me to Genesis 3. If you have it on your iPhone, go ahead and scroll to that. Make sure your Facebook is closed. Here we go. Genesis 3, chapter uh, or verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. By the way, this is going to be different words. I'm reading out of the English Standard, Standard Version. This is the Common English Bible. Both great, just different, slight words. He said to the woman, did God actually say that you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it or you'll die. But the serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delightful to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make someone wise, she took of the fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. Shame entered the picture. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the woman hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Then the, woman, then the Lord God said to the woman, who is this that you, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. The Lord God said to the serpent, because of this, Because of what you have done, cursed are you among all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And this is a reference to Jesus Christ. He shall bruise your head, and you shall strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Whew. Your, desire sh- your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It's such an encouraging passage. Thanks be to God. (laughs) Well, this is the story of the fall of mankind. Whenever you hear Pastor Chris and I or Pastor Kristen reference the fall, now you know it comes from Genesis 3. This is where the story of God changed from a holy, perfect relationship with creation and the the humankind that he created 
to sin entering and suddenly God had to have a different plan. But it's a plan of radical redemption to all creation through Christ Jesus where we're invited back to unhindered relationship with God. But I'm getting ahead of myself. And so, to you, let's talk about sin. What is it? We just learned, we watched a video. I'm asking you an actual question that you can respond. You don't have to stare at me. What is sin? Disobedience. Come on. What's sin? Intentionally choosing to do the wrong thing. Something we all do or have done. Yeah, Cora. What is it? Disrespect to God. Yeah, that's what sin is. So as Nazarenes, we understand from scripture that there's two kinds of sin. You saw it on the video, original sin and personal sin. Original sin, that's what we just read in scripture. It comes from our first parents. We call them that, kind of like a, I don't know, slang term for Adam and Eve. They're the first ones who were in the garden in whole relationship with God, and then it got severed by their choice to try and define good and evil on their own terms, not God's terms. So they sinned, and they began a genetic deformity in all of us. It's called original sin. It's a desire to sin. It's this propensity to be inherently selfish. I don't know if you've ever seen a two-year-old or some adults you know, but there is an inherent selfishness that moves them my way my thing, mine, mine, mine. And that is what original sin is. It's this desire in us that we can't shake off on our own. This desire, this lean, this want to do the things that are not of God, the things that are bad. It's this undercurrent in us that's called original sin. It's the fall. It's chapter 3 in plain sight. Personal sin, the other definition, personal sin, are the actual sins that we do individually. And it says it's decisions made by morally responsible people. We understand that there's some people in the world that aren't able to make those decisions morally. Perhaps they're developmentally disabled or they've got something going on that they can't cognitively make a decision. So we understand that. So we say it's a, it's a decision made by a morally responsible person to disobey a known law of God. We know a lot of laws of God. Love your neighbor, don't murder people, don't envy, don't lust, don't steal, honor your father and mother, um, take care of each other. There's lots of known laws of God in scripture. So it is something that goes against that. It's also bad attitudes that come from that original sin right? That inherent selfishness. Bad attitudes that, you know, are not of the king. So personal sin is primarily and essentially a violation of the law of God's love, right? So when we understand both original sin and personal actual sin, both the same thing, we just have two categories for them, we call that the sinful nature, Sinful nature. This is such a great sermon. Aren't you guys just love It's so encouraging. I just, oh, man, so good. It's hard. This is a hard conversation. Sinful nature. It goes against the first and second greatest commandment that Jesus talked about in Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your soul and your mind and your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. When we sin, we sin against others, which ultimately is also a sin against God, and sometimes we sin against God without sinning against others. It's very clear. Galatians 5, 16 through 21. Turn with me to Galatians 5, 16 through 21. I want you to understand this is a really difficult topic, but if you begin to understand what God has done for you or is calling you to do, to be free from sin, this is a great topic to learn. This is a great uh, amount of scripture in God's word to understand. So Galatians 5, uh, starting in verse 16. But I say, walk 
by the Holy Spirit of God, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. Original sin, you hear that? But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law of original sin, right? You're not under the law of that same thing. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Here's a list. It's not a complete list. But here's a list of things that we battle as humans. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, being angry and violent against each other, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then if you continue in that scripture, you start to read the fruit of the Spirit when God changes your heart. We'll talk about those in a second. If you feel convicted right now, it is not me. The Holy Spirit's calling us to be a people of purity and holiness. That's what we understand as the Church of the Nazarene. God calls us to be holy. It's not something we do. It's something that he does in us. So if you're like me, you're a visual learner, and I have to see this. I have to, like, look at the pictures and understand there's got to be color, and there's got to be things that are happening that I I can see and learn. And there is a a professor of mine, as I was in the course of study to be ordained as as a pastor, his name is Pastor Scott Simons, And he created this tool to help us understand what happens with original sin and personal sin, what happens with salvation, and what happens with entire sanctification, two things that I'll describe to you as we go forward. So I want to uh, look at this together. So each person has three distinct parts of you. So in Genesis 1.26, God said, hey, it's a good idea. If we, he used the word we, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that's the Trinity we just talked about with Pastor Chris. If we make humankind in our image, humankind being males and females in our image. And so God's image includes spirit. So he, God, breathed the Ruach, his spirit into us. And that is the holy part. When, it, when you hear the word um, Ruach, The three definition of it is spirit and uh, breath and wind. Where else in scripture did spirit, breath, and wind happen? Pentecost. Who said that? Bold star. Pentecost. The spirit of God breathed on the people, filled them with the Holy Spirit. That's what happened in Genesis 1. That's super cool. Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2 is when God decided to make humanity and he breathed. And Genesis 2 breathes the spirit into us. Next slide. The second part of each person is the nefesh, your psyche, your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. This is the part that God created for relationship with him and others through thoughts and emotions and choices. Next slide. The third part of each person is the body, the soma. This is the tabernacle in which we dwell. We're created for relationships with God and others and creation. So the next slide after that, this is the perfect state of humanity before the fall. Spirit, soul, body in relationship with each other and relationship with God and relationship with humanity and creation around them. Everything was perfect. And then we know what happened. Next slide. Sin entered the world. You can't see that very well. I apologize for that. But if you look really carefully, oh, yeah, there, thank you. You see the word sin, and you see the word death. That is fallen creation. What happened when sin entered the world? Adam and Eve decided they wanted to make their own definitions of good and evil, so they ate the fruit. The spirit within them encountered death. Now... There was no longer the spirit of God that had been breathed in them. They decided to choose death. And sin began to affect their mind, will, and emotions. And sin began to affect their body. Anybody have diseases in this room? I do. 
So it affected our body. That is where original sin comes from. That's the sin that affects our body. It's a sin that affects our soul. It's the sin that affects our spirit and causes us to be dead in our spirit and broken in our soul and our body. It also affected creation. Anybody see a tornado lately? Anybody see, like, broken parts of the world? Wars? Anybody? Have you seen those on the news? Things that are falling apart in governments, our own, in other ones, things that are falling apart in the world, things that are happening that you see and you're just like, man, that's, I don't think that's the way it meant, it's meant to be. It's not, you guys. That's not how God created it. But brokenness came in and it changed the narrative. Thanks be to God that he changed the narrative again. Amen? Okay, so in Genesis 5, this is the coolest part. This is what helps us understand in Genesis 5, when they start to do the genealogy of people, it says, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them in his likeness. Then Adam and Eve had babies, and they were made in Adam's likeness. It shifted. Why did it shift? Because of the fall. No longer were the people born with God's spirit in them. They were, broken, they were born with a dead spirit original sin. And that's happened again and again and again to us. That's what original sin means. In Leviticus 17, it talks about the fact that a sacrifice is required to take care of sin. Who was the sacrifice? Jesus was the sacrifice. Isn't it so great to be on this side of history when we know what happened? We know who to point to we know who the perfect sinless human, who was fully God as well, did to conquer sin and death. So next slide. When we repent, when we turn away from our sin, God does something amazing. He gives us a new spirit. And that's called regeneration. If you look it up in the dictionary, it says a new growth of um, like they talk about with plant life, a new growth of fibers or organs or um, plant life. It's a regeneration. That happens in our spirit when we say, Jesus, I'm so sorry that I have sinned. All of those sins, I ask that you would cover them. And God says, done, new spirit. Alive in Christ, dead to sin. And that's what happens when we give our hearts to Jesus. That's taking care of our personal sin, right? That's taking care of the sin that we've done, that we've made decisions on. That's the things, uh, that's, that's the definition of personal sin, not the definition of original sin. Hold on to that. He gives us a new spirit, and we call that salvation. Next slide. But the world is still fallen. There's still broken things. And guess what? <sighs> we have old memories, battles that we fight in our mind, we're still under the influence of the world. Old habits remain. I don't know about you, but when I met Jesus, not everything went away. I was given a new spirit, and my, my personal sin was forgiven, but I was still, I still had attitudes, or still today, where God is still sanctifying that. I still had things that I had bad habits over, things that I hadn't uh, allowed to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So we need another work of grace. And I'm preaching about another article of faith, the 10th one that you'll hear in a couple weeks. It's called entire sanctification. Next slide. When entire sanctification happens, our original sin, which comes from who? Adam and Eve. Our original propensity to sin, that desire in us that we can't get free from, that we keep thinking about those things. We keep desiring to do those things. That doesn't always mean we do them, but we desire to do them. And temptation, sometimes we do give in. Sometimes we do do them. And, and those things still are, are broken in us. And we think, man, i got to ask Jesus again. Please forgive my sins that I just did. But I keep having this desire to do them, and I can't shake it off. And God says, I can. I know how. And what entire sanctification is? It is our request of God to not only 
Continue to give us a new spirit and a new heart every day. But shake off original sin from our parents. Shake it off. That genetic deformity, God can make it new. We don't have to be bound by the desire to sin anymore. God can shake it off. John Wesley, one of the the founders and the people that we understand theology and doctrine from, said this about entire sanctification. He said, when I encountered the Lord who gave me ability to have a new holiness from him that affected my soul and my body from my spirit all the way out, the next morning I woke up and I had a love for this person that I had previously despised. What? That's not on John Wesley. He didn't do that. God did that in him. You guys, do you have somebody that you despise? Do you have old habits? Do you have things that have held you captive, even though you've been given a new spirit? Are there things in you that you can't shake off? I have good news. God can do that. He can give you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's, being, it's, it's what we call being baptized by the Holy Spirit. You know, when um, Dom and Anthony got baptized and Maddie got baptized, when you go underwater, when we baptize you that way, it's not like a part of you stays dry. All of you gets covered. That's what entire sanctification by the Holy Spirit is. It covers your mind, will, and emotions, and it affects your body, too. Next slide. Guess what? The best realization is is that we're given a new identity, but we're also, guess what? You know, we talked about the, the, in Genesis 5 where it said that, that God made Adam and Eve and humankind in his likeness, but then Adam and Eve had babies, and that they were in the likeness of Adam. When you experience a new spirit within you, an entire sanctification changes the way you are, you are no longer in the line of Adam, you are in the line of Christ. It changes your heritage. No longer am I related by genetic deformity to Adam. I am now related to Christ because Christ lives in me and is changing the way I think and act and feel and relate and love and invite and welcome and hang out and speak and pray and preach. It changes me. That is entire sanctification. Did you know that scripture never talks about different races based on skin color? color? It's two lines, two races, the line of Adam and the line of Christ. That's just a really cool bit of information for you. Two races, Adam and Christ. I want to be in Christ. I want to be in Christ. So it's a bit confusing because we still battle diseases, right? We still battle illness, but we understand that there is an already and not yet, that we, we are already being made new, but Jesus hasn't come back yet to give us a new body and um, fix all of the rest of the broken things in creation. So we live in the already and the not yet. Now, kids, I understand this is a really hard topic, kids and teens, so I have a 60-second video for you that helps you understand. guys so this morning I know we're staying late thanks for staying with me I want to offer a couple conversations to you a couple opportunities for you to respond 
This morning we talked about two different things. We talked about personal sin and original sin. Personal sin is that thing that gets forgiven. The things that we did, those sins are forgiven when we say, Jesus, would you forgive me? Would you be the Lord of my life? And that's when God says, I'll give you a new spirit. And today, if you haven't ever done that, and you feel your heart beginning to beat out of your chest, and you think, man, Jesus, my spirit needs to be new. I don't want to be dead anymore. I want to be alive in you. Then I invite you to pray this prayer with me. And folks, I also, I also want to invite you that if you are making that decision today, would you let me know? After service, you can let Pastor Chris know or Pastor Kristen know. Don't be ashamed of it. We'll celebrate with you. So if you are choosing today to give your heart to Jesus Christ in a moment of salvation, let's bow our heads and pray. Jesus, I recognize you as the only one who can give me a new spirit and restore my relationship with you. I recognize that you have been loving me since the moment of my existence, and I acknowledge you as Lord and Savior of my life. Make me new. In the name and gift of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. If you chose that today, did you know that salvation and sanctification can happen at the same time? God can do both at the same time in you. Sometimes it takes longer. I wasn't sanctified when I gave my heart to Jesus. It took a long time after that for me to experience that in 2009 when I was sanctified by God. It's also a process. Maturity happens. So salvation, if you just gave your heart to Jesus, I want to know about it. If you gave your heart to Jesus online, would you personally message me and let us know? We want to celebrate with you and we want to come alongside you. And then there's entire sanctification. That shaking off by the Holy Spirit of original sin, that desire to keep doing those things, the desire to give in to that stuff, the desire to have a bad attitude, the desire to say, it's just the way I am. Or my mom had a temper, so I do too. No. Shake it off in the name of Jesus. If you are choosing that today, I want Pastor Chris and Pastor Kristen to come up with me today. I believe with all my might that there are people here today, people here online that have not experienced sanctification. Shaking off the desire to keep doing the wrong things. Shaking off that desire with the Holy Spirit's help to transition the way we live so that it affects our mind, our will, and our emotions, and the way we take care of our bodies. Amen? Amen. So, as we sing a song, I want us to stand today. Would you stand with me? As we sing this song, it's the same song we sang at the beginning of the service. I'm running to your arms, Jesus. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. If you are feeling today, I want to be entirely sanctified. I want Jesus not only just the, the gift of giving me a new spirit, but changing the way my mind, will, and emotions work, then I invite you to come pray with Pastor Chris, or Pastor Kristen. This morning, Jesus, we give you our attention. We give you our time. We don't want to miss an invitation from you. We don't want to miss a decision. Lord Jesus, if you're asking us to be entirely sanctified, if you're asking us to give our hearts to you, Jesus, today, I ask that you give us courage to walk forward. I ask you give us courage to love and lean in and let you change the way we in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, I'm running to you.
if you're feeling that this morning, um, you're like, yeah, I do want to do that, but maybe I'm not very brave to walk down and talk to them. That's okay. We're here. After the service, you can come talk to us about what it is to be entirely sanctified, what it is to give your heart fully to Jesus. So don't be afraid. God's calling this church to new ways of living, to new depth, to revival. I believe it with all I am. Jesus, today, as we learned and understood a really hard topic of Scripture, I just want to give you praise for what you did. I give you praise for the way that you absorbed our sin on the cross. You took it on you. And you silenced sin in our lives when we decide to follow you, Jesus. And then you went to the grave, and three days later, you rose and you said, Death, you don't get the last word. And so, Jesus, we give you praise for who you are. Lord, today, if there's somebody here in person or online that just needs courage and hope, would you give them that? Jesus, if they're being called by your spirit to be entirely sanctified, to give their heart to you, Jesus, I ask that they would run into your arms. Thank you for being a good God. Would you go with us today? Would you walk with us as we navigate being together and eating lunch and talking with each other and encouraging one another? We love you, Jesus. In your precious name, we, we pray. Amen. Go in his peace today.